So hello again, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the infrastructure evolution. Uh, let me start by giving an introduction uh, about this forum, uh, which is dedicated to sharing new perspectives on creating and improving the built environments that shape where we live and work. The main objective of the infrastructure revolution endeavors is to create an influential platform to exchange ideas that lead to a movement for change in the industry. This is a partnership between Turner and Townsend, um, a global professional service firm and industry thought leader, and Columbia University's global leaders in construction management, the GLCM. My name again is Professor Ibrahim Ode. I am the founding director of the GLCM initiative. The GLCM is a strategic management research initiative founded back in 2011. And the main objective of a GLCM is to bridge between theory and the practice during the educational journey of any GLCM member. We are fortunate to have the support of more than 30 companies and over 25 CEOs. We work with our partners on practical cases and studies that we believe can add tremendous and great and positive value to our industry, such as analyzing digital solutions and technological trends that would lead to a digital transformation and reshaping the way we do business and deliver projects. According to the World Economic Forum, in order to support a future world population of 9 billion people and estimated $5 trillion needs to be invested in a global infrastructure every year, President Joe Biden is assembling the next big White House priority, a sweeping $3 trillion package of investments on infrastructure and domestic needs. However, this requires legislators to take action to pass spending bills that authorize funding for this work. And while elected officials at all levels have introduced a number of competing bills, the country still doesn't have a comprehensive infrastructure plan that sets out national priorities, special authorizations, and regulatory frameworks that facilitate the investment. It seems that the question of how to fund this and produce results in a short period of time to stimulate a recessionary economy is the challenge we face. What can we do better? Spending wisely by prioritizing best value. Societies have changed their infrastructure out of either necessity, for example, due to decline in utilization or resources, or opportunity, usually the increased availability of resources or by the adoption of a new technology. However, the traditional approach has been to view projects as an end rather than a means of delivering essential services that move a collective society forward. Owners and investors need to start making shifts to thinking about infrastructure in terms of what it does protects, connects, or progresses, and not simply what it is. And because of the intergenerational life of our infrastructure, project development needs to have a forward view of where the end users want to be in the future rather than where they are now. We believe there is a formula for success in infrastructure development now and into the future. It is a combination of a public and a private investments into high quality assets that will improve customer experience for the centric life cycle, improving the economic stability and mobility of individuals and businesses in the communities served by these assets, as well as leveraging technology to eliminate waste and increase productivity. In the future, we will continue to bring together leaders in our industry to explore all of these topics through video net interviews, podcasts, virtual events like today, and eventually live get together like we, we are more used to, as well as a combination of both. 
we will seek to present a forward-looking view of the industry and ask how all members of our industry can create a better value proposition to owners, investors, and society itself. We'll explore what changes are required and how the industry can adopt a progressive collaborative approach that sustains supply side business performance while delivering better outcomes for the end user. We do believe the industry must work as one to create a platform for investing in the future and act as a catalyst for growth, innovation, and equity. We hope that you will follow along and be an active participant in our ongoing events and conversations. And for our event today, I'm so glad to announce that we already reached a full registration at our first event. Our audience is drawn from all parts of the industry and the world, engineering, construction firms, the owner operators, the investor, the supply chain, including the specialist suppliers, as well as, of course, academic institutions from my colleagues, faculties, as well as students. My good friend and colleagues, both Tim McManus and Maury Rowden, will lead two groups that will explore what makes a project investable and how to prioritize these investments and spend the money wisely. Our guests have and continue to manage some of the largest and most complex infrastructure systems in the world and will give us insight into how we can improve our practices of funding, procuring, constructing, and commissioning new assets. So let me welcome all of you and now turn it over to my very good friends and colleagues, Tim McManus. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, I'm Tim McManus. I'm a member of the Board of Directors for the Americas for Turner and Townsend. I'm also the Industry Director for the Global Leaders in Construction Management Program at Columbia. And I'm also the Chair of the Board of Advisors for the Smart City Works Venture Studio. <clears throat> I'm honored to be joined here today by two leaders in the industry who I also consider to be good friends. Kevin Corbett is the CEO of New Jersey Transit responsible for the nation's largest statewide public transportation system with more than 11,000 employees and more than two, taking 944,000 workday, weekday trips when operating at normal capacity. John Dionisio has been a partner and the director of business development uh, for Meridian uh, North America for the last 15 years. And Meridian is one of the largest private investors in public infrastructure in the world. I especially want to thank these two Georgetown alums for joining us today, despite the fact that they got knocked out of the NCAA tournament last week and ruined my bracket. But I'll put that beside. But thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. Uh, we've all seen the latest ASCD infrastructure report card for the United States. And while we're very happy that the America got a grade, a passing grade of C plus, barely passing, better than a D minus four years ago. It's indicative that our infrastructure is still broken. In the state of New York, for example, 10% of the bridges in the state are structurally deficient. Uh, road repairs throughout the state cost drivers an average of $625 each. The need for drinking water improvement and expansion requires a total of $23 billion. So it's indicative that New York State, one of the most advanced states in our union, still has a long way to go with our infrastructure. In addition to the grade, uh, we've also seen that the gap between what is projected to be funded by government and what is needed to bring America's infrastructure up to a state of good repair has risen significantly over the last four years by half a trillion dollars to a total of 2.6 trillion dollars. If this continued underinvestment in our infrastructure continues for the next 15 to 20 years, it's going to cost our country significantly. It'll mean a total of about $10 trillion of economic loss. It could mean a loss of 3 million jobs. And it could also mean a loss of about $2.4 trillion of lost exports. Now, for folks like John at Meridium and Gerard Bouchel at Carlisle Airports Group, this provides a great opportunity for private investment to advance and further develop our nation's highways, rail systems, uh, and bridges, and in Gerard's case, uh, JFK Airport and Terminal One. 
My last check, though, indicates that about 70% of our states across the country allow public-private partnerships by legislation. But in reality, only eight to 10 states really drive PPPs. In order to attract private investment, it's essential to make such projects investable and attractive to the meridians of the world, the Carlisles of the world, and supportive of the capital plans of agencies like New Jersey Transit and the Port Authority of New York. And that's what we want to explore here today. So Kevin, let me start with you, if I could. This past year, uh, you developed a capital plan for New Jersey Transit for the first time. And given all of the revenue challenges that you've seen and you're currently seeing, uh, do you foresee a greater use of private investment in public infrastructure to support NJT's overall capital program? Uh, yeah, Tim, thanks. And a pleasure being here. And thanks for everyone to you know, join us today. Um, as certainly John, I think Catherine Garcia, so a whole bunch of friends out there, but uh, absolutely, you know, we have a $17 billion capital plan, the first one, and we were uh, known to be an agency in tremendous uh, trouble when I came in three years ago uh, with Governor Murphy, and, you know, in order to write the ship, we didn't even have a, a basic baseline assessment. It was you know, good people, but they were just trying to constantly put Band-Aid and duct tape to try to keep, uh, keep the system going. So without having a five-year capital plan and a strategic plan where you're going to be taking the agency, you know, you have to get, yeah, you need the funding. And so we put that together and we have about 12 billion of that 17 billion identified. So we have a $5 billion gap. And this is very similar to a lot of transit uh, agencies around the country and around the, uh, around the globe. So, uh, you know, we're certainly very, uh, uh, positive on the uh, comments that we're hearing out of the Biden administration. Certainly, Secretary Buttigieg yesterday, uh, you know, gave a big plug for a project very near and dear to our hearts. Uh, you know, the uh, Hudson Tunnel project, the Gateway project, uh, together with uh, our colleagues Amtrak and uh, friends over in New York. Um, but there's a lot more of that where you look at being able to fill that gap. Uh, states always have their ups and downs with their budget cycles, and they're competing with healthcare, education, uh, et cetera. And the main focus for most transit agency is the state of good repair, you know, making sure you maintain your system. So as we look at the need for expansion, certainly in congested areas like New Jersey, the most congested, highly populated uh, state in the country on uh, per square mile, you know, population density, we're not gonna be building many highways to get out of that. So as, as we have growth, it really has to be through our transit systems. And uh, when we look at what we need to do just to maintain, uh, you know, very, a lot of these things are legacy from the 19th century railroads that went bankrupt. So we, you know, we look at some of the expansion projects we'd like to do and clearly, uh, you know, there, there, there's not going to be enough money coming from, for our case, Trenton, and even likely from Washington. Uh, so, uh, we, we, we need to look to fill that gap with, uh, you know, public private partnerships. And, and I would say in New Jersey and New York, they're having some very successful ones. The general tone is that, uh, you know, in the US, as you said, only eight states, but even some of the places where you have had progress and it seems to uh, die off. And I think there really is a critical need for that going forward in the coming years. That's great, Kevin, thank you. So John, speaking of PPPs, uh, <clears throat> we, there's been a lot of discussion around the challenges regarding um, the challenges that concessionaires like Meridian face for the procurement of PPPs in terms of uh, equitable risk transfer, the time and the expense of the procurement process. Uh, based on the work that you've seen and the things that you've done, what are two or three of the recommendations that you would make that could improve the procurement process for a public-private partnership? Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Tim. And um, first off, thank you for, for inviting me um, I must say that sharing the stage with Kevin, who I've known gratefully for a very long time, is humbling. Uh, the fact that the Hoyas could represent is also impressive. Um, and as a SEPA alum, I must also give, out, give a shout out to Columbia. Uh, so I'm happy to be here. Um, it's a great question. You know, P3 has been a very effective tool to unlock some of the most critically important infrastructure projects globally, but certainly here in the US, not far from where I'm sitting now, LaGuardia Airport Central Terminal, the first airport of this scale really to be built in the US since the 80s, adopted the P3 model. And other projects, as many I'm sure in the audience have studied or know, the Port of Miami Tunnel, the Long Beach Courthouse, 
have all been successful examples of how P3s could be procured well. Uh, before I get to recommendations, I, I thought it'd be important to note that what I think makes investments attractive for private investors is also the assurance that the proper technical parties are willing and able to take the risks needed to really do two things. Number one, give the client comfort that they are getting value for money. And number two, give the investor comfort that they're mitigating, mitigating risk. Without some changes to the way projects are procured, without learning from lessons, I fear that contractors and operators may continue to lose interest which in turn will affect the private sector's interest in these projects. So figuring out how to learn from where it's worked well um, and taking stock of where it hasn't worked well, I think is important. And after being in this business in six, for, for 16 years now, um, the three recommendations that I thought I'd share are as follows. Uh, first, best value determination should always include technical points. Um, this is a world where engineering and program management innovation should win projects, not financial engineering. Uh, it shouldn't be surprising that most the most heralded P3 projects, the ones that finish on time and under budget, aren't necessarily the ones that are awarded to the lowest bidder. Secondly, uh, risk transfer doesn't mean leaving the private sector alone without any support. Infrastructure is complicated and even the best run procurements still, still need to account for unknowns that arise during construction and operations. Clients need to be committed to help solve problems even if the financial risk does not squit, fit squarely with them. And at the same time, the private sector needs to engage clients and partner effectively. And the last recommendation um, I note is that we, we, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. I've said this on other panels, but clients in the U.S. should be more Canadian and start with where the last projects have succeeded. Um, there have been great advancements in risk transfer, and actually there are now great contractual documents in the market that coalesce on proper risk transfer. TxDOT is one place where with the help of industry experts, they rewrote the design build guideline to address some of the imbalance risk transfer. So I hope that that model can find itself uh, with other clients um, so we're not reinventing the wheel each time. That's great, John. I, I think to your point, we've also seen over the last couple of years, a couple of major contractors who said we're not gonna play in the PPP space anymore just because of the inequitable risk transfer. So we've seen that fall out exactly. And you mentioned being Canadian infrastructure, Ontario uh, clearly has progressed many P3s uh, very successfully across social infrastructure as well as regular infrastructure. So great points. Um, Kevin, I wanna come back to you in a second about uh, what are your expectations about the stimulus bill for infrastructure? But let me ask the two of you, um, when you look at the UK, Canada, Australia, uh, Germany, um, they have a national infrastructure plan. They've had a national infrastructure plan for years. It joins together, it pulls together priorities. It helps the economy grow in a certain direction in a very joined up way. Do either of you foresee anything like that coming about on, with this administration or beyond? Yeah, I guess, uh, John, I'll take a first stab. Uh, I certainly do, Tim. I, and I, I think it's tricky because, you know, in the U.S., with the federal system, people are often, you know, suspicious of, you know, we're from the, we're from Washington and we're here to help. But if you look back, you know, to the Eisenhower era, if you, when you look at when UMPTO was set up, you know, having a national policy, whether the funding be competitively, you know, for grants that you have to compete for, but you know, if you have a plan that's that's it's like any business plan, you need to have something there, maybe variations. But if you have a plan, then you know what the, it sort of sets the table for what you're. Uh, can do or uh, can't do and what's going to be incentivized or discouraged. So uh, I think the current administration certainly is talking that way. And I think, you know, if packaged the right way, uh, just as Eisenhower did with the highway system, I think a national infrastructure plan is, is certainly sellable. Particularly if it's backed by money. <laughs> yeah, that always helps, right? John, what's your take? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I think that I, I agree wholeheartedly. What, you know, one of the things that has been 
part of the debate, and I know the secretary mentioned this recently, is the notion of a national infrastructure bank. Well, I agree with everything Kevin said with respect to a plan. Um, and I think the analogy of strategic plan in a business is really a powerful one. Um, I think a national infrastructure bank um, is more necessary from a funding perspective and as a way to unlock projects. I think there are currently tools in, in, in existence at the federal government level through TIFIA, through PABS, through RIF, on the renewable energy side, their credit programs that have been super tools to unlock projects. And my advice to the federal government would be if there is a national infrastructure plan and a bank, it should focus on providing catalytic capital to get projects started, um, to allow transit authorities and transportation to parties to have funding to go through design and environmental processes that enable projects. Um, because with respect to funding projects or financing projects, there are some great tools that exist um, that should be reinforced. That's great. So let's stay on that same theme. So Kevin, you mentioned your discussions with Secretary Buttigieg and John, I know you've been advocating for certain elements of an infrastructure stimulus plan in DC. What, what do each of you expect to come out of the expected infrastructure bill? Not to spill any beans or inside knowledge, but what are your expectations and senses? I know a lot of people are trying to move in different directions. We agree different things, but what, what do you, the two of you think? Well, I guess uh, yeah, I wish I had some insight because I'd like to be in, the, you know, in there. But I think certainly this administration is putting a major marker down. And uh, you, you see that from Secretary Buttigieg and from the White House about the uh, about infrastructure and wanting to get things done. They see this as a window of opportunity, really even the next two years, much less the next four. Uh, so, uh, and they're talking, you know, obviously, you know, very significant sums of money. What, what it actually ends up coming out at the end, I think there's, you know, sort of falls in three buckets. One which uh, makes me a, a little nervous just personally is the earmark process coming back. Uh, you know, it, it, depending how that use that can, uh, you know, divert funding from, you know, things that are either national projects, like we have the Northeast Quarter, I co-chair the Northeast uh, Quarter Commission with Amit Bose, the head of the FRA. And so we need the whole quarter needs massive investments uh, and, and support from the, the government. Uh, and then for us in New Jersey, independent of our involvement with the Northeast Quarter, which is a critical part of our, our transit system, we have huge needs of bus electrification, uh, you know, the fleet, bring down the average age of our fleets, et cetera. So there's uh, as well as all sorts of, uh, you know, we have the Hudson Bergen light rail, which was a D bomb that was done, you know, uh, 30 something years ago. Uh, that was very successful public private partnership. Uh, but we need to expand that up to above the George Washington bridge for those, you know, the area. So, uh, and again, that some of those, uh, will be funding. So I think the funding is critical, but also the process, you know, John mentioned it doesn't passing, but the importance of, of permitting for investors, you want to know, you know, if you're going to be going into a project that is gonna actually move ahead. You know, if you look at the business development dollars that you have to sink into, you know, big projects. Um, and if it's a NEPA process and local permitting and state historic preservation, uh, you know, permits, you know, you look at some projects and it, it particularly if the uh, community is not receptive, you know, uh, as a private investor, it scares a lot of them away because they look at the challenges. So I think getting the, the soft side, not just the, the money side, but making that process, so uh, reducing the risk, there's certain things, the, Public sector can help reduce the risk and take more risk on itself. Certain things the private sector is good at. That, you know, public sector may feel risky, but the private sector is used to doing all the time. So that risk sharing, but part of that is really getting uh, permitting and other other uh, local uh, issues resolved. Because otherwise, people just say, you know, the money goes where it's treated best. And I think in that, I would also add that it's really important to to work. You know, I love transportation you know, as my my career, but it's not just transportation for transportation's sake. You need to get, you know, broader buy-in, uh, you know, from society, from labor, from environmental groups, et cetera, so that it makes it easier for the decision makers doing that permitting to see, hey, wait, this really does have support. I'm not going to get fired if I permit this thing because, you know, I, I made all sorts of enemies. So I think there's a lot of soft issues aside from the federal planning, federal dollars. Uh, also, a lot of, every project is local, has its own personality. So I think those are important issues, too. Great. John, you, any insights or yeah, no, again, not, not a tremendous amount to add. I, I'm hoping that, uh, as I mentioned previously, some of the programs that have been very effective are continued to be reinforced. 
there are prob there's probably 30 to 40 billion dollars of infrastructure assets in the US that would not be uh, possible without private activity bonds and TIFIA. Um, private and private activity bonds, the cap has been reached and it requires uh, reauthorization. So I'm hoping that the new administration will uh, continue to focus on these tools that again have been effective enablers in really most of, if not all of the transportation P3s in the last decade. And then I'm also hopeful for some clarity, some dollars around um, how resilient infrastructure, and that this doesn't mean new energy projects, but resilient projects within transportation, um, rail electrification that we know, I know Kevin's focused on, um, electrification from a vehicle perspective, figuring out how funding could unlock those opportunities nationwide is also something that um, I'm hopeful will be clarified with this administration. Yeah, to the point that both of you brought up about equitable risk or risk share, and I know there's also been discussion about establishing a risk bank, if you will, where you would be able to bank risk money where, as opposed to one part or the other, taking the risk contractually, that it would be pre-funded in accordance with that. So that as it came up, where both parties would be allowed to proceed. So some interesting ideas, so we'll keep touch and hopefully we'll start hearing some things very soon, but it should be, should be welcome for everybody when it does come out. Uh, John, let me ask you, you, you talked before about some of the factors that you look for when considering a PPP opportunity. Could you just touch on what are one or two, maybe three elements or factors that make a P3 attractive to you in Meridium? Yeah, sure. Yeah, the first one is the first one is somewhat um, somewhat subjective. It's I, I call it essentiality. Um, why does the project make sense now? And why does the project make sense for decades to come? Um, transit projects in the state of New Jersey or the state of New York are essential. It helps people move from point A to point B effectively to avoid congestion, um, courthouses, um, schools, et cetera. So for us at Meridium, it's a very somewhat easy first gate. Is this project essential? Will it be impactful for the community? Um, um, the second is, and this is something that's growing um, uh, with more focus, is ESG considerations. Um, for us here at Meridium, it's imperative. How does the infrastructure idea take into consideration environmental, social, and good governance practices? Um, and included in this is getting the community involved as soon as possible. And the third um, is strong government. Uh, you you mentioned government needing to um, be champions of projects, having the right leaders, people like Kevin, people like Pat Foy, um, but a strong government with a clear path to understanding how the private sector is going to be repaid, where the dollars are coming from to repay the private debt equity, the private debt and private equity is important. Um, P3, as you've heard many times, P3 is a tremendous finance and risk transfer tool. It is not something that bridges funding gaps. Um, so I think uh, strong government clients understand that and that therefore it's important that as a consideration to make sure that your, your counterpart is, um, has the financial wherewithal to get a project completed. Uh, those are great perspectives. Those are great insights and perspectives from both of you. And hopefully your comments will inspire other ideas and solutions to this funding challenge that our country has and our country's infrastructure has in a very significant way. So Kevin, thank you. John, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and your insights as always. I'll now turn it over to Murray Roden, the Global Director of Infrastructure for Turner and Downs. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, John. So just bridging on some of the points there, I think we could set out challenges and uh, some of the enablers that are there. Uh, we've got to kind of look at the industry response now. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome two, an honour to welcome two eminent contributors to, to this panel discussion. So we've got Catherine Garcia. So Catherine, welcome Catherine. So Catherine's a candidate for the Mayor of New York City. and was most recently the Commissioner of New York City Department of Sanitation. Prior to that, she served in the executive roles within New York City Department 
of environmental protection and actually finishing our tenure with the agency as a chief operating officer. So welcome, Catherine. And to uh, Gerard uh, Michelle. So Gerard, welcome. Gerard is the uh, executive chair of the New York, uh, so the new Terminal One Development JFK. It is a team responsible for advancing a public-private partnership, which has been discussed with the Port Authority, um, valued at eight million dollars, and uh, and also other aspects that John brought up there is promoting community engagement, labour participation, and MWBE goals. <coughs> the effect said. Uh, in 2015, he was appointed and confirmed president CEO of DASNET, the nation's top issuer of infrastructure, financing and infrastructure management with a yearly construction portfolio of six billion. Um, and actually DASNET became the nation's number one issuer of more than 38 billion of municipal debt for public and private infrastructure projects across New York State. So welcome, Catherine, and welcome, Gerard. It's a quick introduction myself, <clears throat> as, um, as in the slide there, is uh, I have two roles, basically. I have a geographical role in the business of America, America's Region MD and a global head of infrastructure. A lot of global experience so across major programs and projects across the world. It's great to see we've got a good, good global audience uh, participating with us today. Um, I've also helped uh, shape government policy and strategies. Uh, and there's a reference point to National Infrastructure Plan in the UK being one of them. I've been based in the UK now for five years. Uh, and I would just uh, give a shout out. So I know I've got a colleague of mine, Don Ward, who is the CEO, CEO of uh, uh, Construction Excellence. So I was at, when I was in Europe, the chairman of Construction Excellence, this was a body which is similar to this kind of vehicle in terms of movement for change. So really got an industry uh, involvement around more outcome focus in the collaborative industry. Um, and a shout out for, it kind of reminds me, there was a publication in, back in 2008 called Never Waste a Crisis. And I think this is an opportunity to reflect on uh, some of the points that were made in that. So a few words on what we've heard and a hypothesis, and again, reference back to John, uh, a few industry mega themes, carbon zero journey, climate change, global warming, need for resilient infrastructure, and there's the social economic ambitions, building back better, leveling up society, social equity. But also in, the, in all of that, projects are materially more complex. Um, when you think about the digitalization, different clock speed, from physical infrastructure, so they're more complicated. And the expectation on impact on, of infrastructure and the speed at which infrastructure delivered is also a factor that we need to consider. So we've heard about massive levels funding and the point was made, the difference between funding and financing, but that needs better execution, better planning and execution, and really the start and finish of those, those end in mind. So globally, recognize the global audience here, the need for investing in infrastructure has never, ever been higher. So the Biden administration, we've heard about the energy and infrastructure bill. It's going to provide an injection fund, but can it also act as a catalyst to stimulate private sector partnerships? So Tim referenced the gap between what the number that might come out of the Biden uh, infrastructure bill versus what is actually needed earlier on. So the question, stepping back, we need to ask ourselves, is the industry in its widest sense uh, fit to take on this challenge? You know, Recognising that we are investing today and tomorrow's tax payers money it's obviously incumbent on us as an industry to spend that money wisely so the question maybe the hypothesis and the question does the industry need to change and in what way so perhaps we can move on to exploring now those points with uh, Catherine and Gerard you know, obviously extensive experience in funding and delivering big ambitious infrastructure so perhaps Catherine I can start with yourself just turn to you and uh, if you could share some of your thoughts and experiences and how you see the opportunity arising from the infrastructure bill and also the challenges that that presents. So Kathy can invite some comments from yourself. Absolutely. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, to get it right. I mean, one of the big rubs I would say from taxpayers is they see many projects uh, that last for years and go way over budget and do not think that they are getting value for their tax dollar. Uh, because if you poll people, they do want to make sure that we keep the bridges from falling down, that they are getting their drinking water. Uh, but thinking about how we do this in a more collaborative way, you know, one of the things that's perhaps particular to the U.S. is uh, how much litigation we end up doing around our projects. Uh, and so we spend an enormous amount of time crafting contracts that make it so we are never partners. And the second piece that I would say is that not only do you need investment in the physical infrastructure and in the delivery from companies to get it done, 
but you need to make sure uh, that you have on the other side, strong folks within agencies who can help you solve problems. Uh, whether or not that is regarding procurement or design changes that need to happen or field conditions that have come up. Uh, but even beyond that, if you look at sort of what was talked about before on the soft issues, the issues of permitting, the issues of getting land approvals, uh, that is actually something government should be better at to be better partners moving forward because we need to be fast and we need to make it so that people are feeling the impact of what is perhaps going to be a very large bill uh, coming out of Washington. Thank you, Captain. And Jared, just you're right in the middle, obviously, of a, a, a very extensive major investment. And to add to that, you're right, right in the middle. Uh, in it, well, we're all right in the middle of a global pandemic, which has significantly impacted aviation as one one of the industries that's been very impacted. But in terms of how, what are you seeing in terms of equate the environment for success, and what do you see the changes that we need to make to address the points I, I was making and spending that money wisely and the points that Catherine proposed? Right. So thank you. The, the first thing that's very important is how do you structure an environment where the outcomes of success are going to be mutually supportive, mutually beneficial? And historically, when we talked about infrastructure, you know, we talk about a policy, right? But there's a politics behind infrastructure and the politics behind infrastructure, certainly in, in this nation, uh, it's, it's not just a national policy. Right, it's a national policy that has many inputs that bubble up. All right, from the states and the municipalities, and so you 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 need to make sure that as we sharpen our tools, and as we think about the outcomes that are going to be meaningful to people and processes, we've got to not only look at the hard assets but the soft assets, and so really focusing on. What are the structure of incentives to ensure that not only are we delivering important infrastructure, as John said, essential infrastructure, right? That's very important. <clears throat> um, the other aspect is, you know, what's the scale of this infrastructure in terms of communities uh, as well as uh, customers, right? So uh, is this a public benefit? Does this have private use? You know. Customers and 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 and, uh, and clients are very important as you you focus on that. And then the third piece that we really do have to come to terms with is the partnerships that we are intentional about in terms of building our infrastructure so that the community does have favorable outcomes. And when we talk about sort of these soft assets, we're talking about human capital. We're talking about how people use assets. And with respect to the question of human capital, you know, wherever you do infrastructure, folks want jobs. They want local participation. Um, there is a focus on the procurement practices and policies, MWBE participation. The whole question of, you know, unequal outcomes, all right, and disparities that have been very visible, all right, in the space of infrastructure, very visible in, in this world that we operate in, that is going to be one of the big cleavages that we're going to have to reconcile if we're going to move big and smaller projects. And so what we decided to do at the new Terminal One team was intentionally bring together a coalition of investors, a global capital financial institution, a national MWBE partner, as well as labor. And through that consortium, really dig deep into building out a partnership with a public entity, the Port Authority. But most importantly, recognize how do we, the risk that we're taking and the commercial benefits that we're going to generate, how do we make sure that the community benefits? And so as we look at the scope and scale of our project over a four to six year period. Um, in phases, there's a financial design, construction and operational side and local community participation is very important. All right, at every step of 
for every stage of that project. Um, we have to generate close to $1.4 billion of MWBE participation. We do have liquidated damages. We have to make a good faith effort. And so what I would say that's very important, and this has come up earlier, risk sharing, but you need to make sure that you have the incentives that can create similar outcomes or as close to equal outcomes as possible. Thanks, Joe. There is a number of comments coming on PPP, so I will come back to maybe some points in the, the comments about of PPP, but uh, just building some of your points there, it, it, for me, in that observation, Catherine, you were talking about, I think we're all talking about risk and all this risk allocation. We're talking about better procurement models and better funding models, and we're talking about this public private ship, public private uh, partnership in a, in a kind of new form. We just to try and expand on that. And then one of the other areas is, you know, what is the purpose of infrastructure and what does it serve? There's a big theme around that, and perhaps the lens of that has changed over a number of years. Just, Catherine, just I'll bring you back in. And we will come back to the PPP question, but, you know, construction is the oldest industry in the world, you know, maybe it was a creation, you know, a creation of, uh, of of caves or whatever back in the day, but fundamentally it was the old, oldest uh, in the world. It's changed significantly, but the social impact that construction, engineering construction infrastructure has, you know, just building on that, how did you see this object in terms of the concept of level up society, social equity? Can you just expand on that in terms of some of your thoughts, Catherine? Certainly, and, and, and let me just also say that my experience is not in a, a PPP uh, yeah. because my experience has been primarily uh, in the water at, or the civil works of uh, cities and we just went directly to the market yeah. um, and had the ability to get the capital we needed at extraordinarily low rates to be able to do it. But we still always then are going to hire someone to work with. Uh, and we are often doing projects that communities don't necessarily love, like building a waste transfer station. <laughs> um, let me just tell you, if you'd like to build something else, you should tell them you're building a waste transfer station and then they will love whatever it is you <laughs> want to build. Um, and so it is having those the ongoing, what is this benefit to that local community? What is it benefiting to the larger community? Part of the way we got through the advocacy, because obviously we needed permits and everything else, is you were talking about taking 60 million truck miles off the road with this piece of infrastructure uh, and being able to clearly articulate, not only does this help us do our day-to-day -day job of we've got to transport this to some place for final disposal, but we get to choose how we do that as a society. And we're choosing to do it in a way that is cleaner for the environment. Um, and when you are looking through those lenses of not just uh, what do you need, but where are you putting it uh, is extraordinarily important, like that there is a sense of balance and fairness and we do not end up uh, burdening any one community with what can be nuisance infrastructure, uh, but also that we're making investments in the things that people really want uh, more likely is are you building the new school in their community? Uh, and I would go so far as to say that we should be thinking about infrastructure more broadly than roads and pipes and bridges, but are we considering public housing infrastructure? Um, are we considering parks as infrastructure uh, that serve social purposes and should be on par with the roads and bridges and um, and pipes that have been more traditionally thought of. Uh, and I think that not only is it imperative that all of the industry come to the table with that perspective, it's not just, you know, scope, cost, schedule. It also has to be, what are the environmental benefits? What is the long-term operating cost of this? So what is your lifetime cost? Because uh, you can get something real cheap, but it's going to cost you a ton of money on the back end to keep it working. Um, and how, as uh, Gerard said, who is benefiting from the actual work? You know, if everybody thinks that somebody else gets the job, you have less buy-in to the projects. Yeah, I think you raise an important point there, Catherine. Do you, do you think, just building on your points, do you think 
industry or the idea is what industry needs to improve, how it actually sells the benefit of the industry in terms of infrastructure. Because I always, when I, when I used to travel the world, I used to get in, a, get in a cab and then ask the cab driver what they thought about infrastructure. It was never tend to be too positive, you know, because they've got, gotten their way of doing their job. But um, but just in terms of the selling, the, the, how we sell infrastructure now, because it does disturb people's lives, doesn't it, of course? Yeah, I mean, there, there's also two things, that, there's a few things that I found out on infrastructure is nobody wants it and then it's there and they completely forget why they hated the idea. Um, you know, uh, you know, I am sure that at LaGuardia, there has been an unending stream of complaints about traffic on the Grand Central Parkway during construction. And as soon as you're finished, everyone will forget and be like, oh, this beautiful new airport just happened to show up. Uh, and the hours caught in traffic will will be forgotten. Um, but I actually think we need to be having a really broader community conversation. So beyond just your local community, you know, when you think of some of the big projects that are going to need to happen in New York City, like the BQE, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, which is cantilevered and in very dire shape, dates back probably 70 years, um, we're, we've only been focused on the local community where the construction happens, but those impacts will be far broader, both positive and negative, and we should be having those conversations and bringing to the table why these are good things. Like this, is, this has got to be bigger uh, than the, what we are talking about now. Absolutely. Totally concur. So I, I, would, also, uh, I, I would say to, to one of the things that Catherine said, um, you know, what is infrastructure? How are we thinking about infrastructure? Mm. Who cares what we think? I mean, people, people tell us, okay, what's meaningful and what's important. So, you know, infrastructure is, is, is going to be more than, you know, bridges, roads, tunnels, uh, transportation. It's going to include housing. There's, there's no question about it. It's going to include, when we think about digitization and living in a world of a pandemic today, people are struggling with how they educate their children. Their children are in the midst of losing one to two years of schooling. And so the, the demands are, are going to just grow exponentially in terms of how we think about infrastructure. And a lot of that is gonna come from the social dimension. And so when, when I was at DASNY, you know, when I took that role and responsibility to go back into government, one of the things that just hit me over the head in the first few months was, again, working in a public authority which represents this intersection between the market and, and, and government, right? It's the third sector, the third way, where we had the ability to use our procurement process and move a lot faster than many of our peers, right? We had the ability to go into the market and finance all right, with many of our private partners, universities, life science institutions, uh, courts, um, you know, state and local governments, higher education institutions, but we still couldn't move as quickly as the private sector. And to boot, we couldn't innovate as quickly as the private sector. And so I think there's an incredible opportunity for all of us to come together and really rethink this framework, but foundationally, we've yeah. got to come to terms, all right, with people and process. You've got to come to terms with that because if we're not capturing and people are not benefiting, this goes for naught. Like you said, you get in the taxi and and the taxi driver can't tell you, you know, what's the value of, of what we have done. And there, there's a test. So we'll, we'll, we'll practice some taxi drivers and educate them in terms of that. <laughs> But I think what I'm hearing is, and back to my experiences, the why, why it was mentioned before, a national infrastructure plan. A national infrastructure plan is connects up to level up, leveling up society. That's, and obviously all the other dimensions I talked about in terms of carbon zero journey, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, that it's, that's what it's going to respond to. And in turn, I think one of the areas that uh, is creating a, a national skills plan, that's always part of where, when I've been working with jurisdictions, governments, in terms of creating that national skills plan. And it's all but connected all together. And of course, the big feature of what we have been talking around is how we get a new model of public-private sector partnership 
perhaps for the common good. Very aspirational, but perhaps that's where I'm bunch of time. I have to drag you into this, Gerard. Um, there is a great debate. I don't know if you've noticed some of the comments of um, some people love PPP, obviously, and some people uh, are perhaps opposite. Maybe some perspectives on PPP because you're right in the middle of that and you've know, got a lot of experience. <laughs> Well, you'll uh, be the world global arbitrator on PPP. Here's your opportunity. We, we, we have learned a fair number of lessons um, <clears throat> from this debate. Look, <clears throat> the bottom line is the question of risk sharing, risk transfer. Um, that is a huge challenge, um, particularly if you are <clears throat> leading one of the largest, if not the largest public-private partnership. Um, so... The financial community likes it, the developers like it, but the contractors don't like it, right? Yeah. So that, that we know. And so we really have to, to, to think through, and part of that is how we engage ratings institutions, investors, to really think about how we solve problems together. Because the challenge that we, we, we really struggle with is, you know, we can, we can bring the financing to this and we have done that. Um, but with a project of this scale, there are very few, very few contractors that can really mobilize resources, uh, carry the types of guarantees, the parent company guarantees, the letter of credits. In other words, the, the security packages necessary to advance the project. Now, we're in the midst of a procurement. We do have a competitive procurement. Uh, we feel very good about that. Uh, we're looking at ways to introduce alternative delivery methods beyond just really uh, a, a guaranteed maximum price. Maybe look at something like a progressive. Um, you know, we, we thought about, could we do multi-prime? But again, a lot of that is going to be predicated upon what we can sell to ratings institutions, how much additional contingency would we set aside? Yeah. Um, what's the completion risk? So this is a provocative, this is a provocative debate. We, we sit at the center of it. We do, however, feel that we on our side have to provide solutions. And so that's Carlisle, JLC, and Ulico. How do we unlock the opportunity to move this project forward? Because we want pause due to the pandemic. Yeah. So don't have all the answers. We, we, we learn as we continue to run, but I think we're alive and, and we feel very good about the opportunity set and the way in which we're approaching it. It's great to hear. Conscious of uh, we've got a few minutes left. Catherine, just <coughs> any, any can, yes, a question I, I've been following in the chat. Uh, when you are talking about Terminal One, or you know, when I did like you know, the Croton treatment plant, which ended up being, I think, you know, close to three billion dollars, and or and doing the UV facility at the same time. Uh, is the market prepared to take, I mean, the, we only ever had a few players who bid on it. It's not, they weren't PPP projects. They were straight construction projects, but when we wanted to go big, there just was not that much competition at that scale of people who could come in and manage projects at that scale. I, I just feel like that that is another piece to be thinking about is if we're gonna do really big things do we have the really big contractors who want to come and bid in the U.S. to do that, or U.S. companies? And I don't know. I haven't been in the market in a while for something of that scale. Yeah. Well, we have the big contractors. The question really comes to the structure of incentives um, and really the flow down of risks, the types of contracts that are written, um, questions around liquidated damages, um, you know, the, these become big issues. And so, you know, we can do these. And at DASNY, we did a number of small P3s. They mm -hmm. were real simple. <laughs> they were, you know, they were, you know, I mean, somebody could pick up, you know, these, these bigger firms, you know, if it's $25 million or $35 million, oh, they love doing it. They love doing design build. 
but I, but I think the level of risk that shifts to each side of sort of the, the, the stage becomes huge. Mm-hmm. We don't want to take all that risk. They don't want to take the risk. The public entity doesn't want to keep all of that risk. So I think we really do need a way to reconcile how do we apportion this risk budget and how do we create solutions to solve problems? Because ultimately, you know, if the project does not go forward and we're in the middle of this, everybody's impacted negatively. It's mm-hmm. huge, right? So one goes out of business, yep. you know, the next you can't do procurements because no one wants to take on that project. Um, the other side of us, we're no longer in business. This is huge. So we've got to really rethink that uh, in terms of scale. And, and that also leads into the, the, the investment needs to come in, how you, how you embrace innovation. You know, all of that's linked to the business model of the industry. So the fa- fascinating conversation. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, but the good news for everybody is that uh, we are continuing to run these. So we're going to continue the debate. I think we've said it's been a great Fantastic first uh, session we've had, the infrastructure evolution uh, movement, that's what we're calling it. So there's a bit of movement of change, but it started the debate, which has been great. So I'd like to thank everybody who's participated on this. Uh, you know, it's been a, a lot, maybe as many challenges put up as, as maybe solutions, but at least we'll get, certainly get the debate going. Just some concluding points for me, you know, would, would be, I think we're going to step back with this and just, the point Catherine we're discussing around the industry has better got better put its case forward in, in, a, in a sense, in this wider sense, and that might be attracting new talent into the industry, attracting the funding, um, because there's a talent, there's a capability issue that you've, you've rightly brought up. But I think under the themes, it's got to be more productive, it's got to be clean, and it's got to deliver better value. Uh, and that's that's probably sits at the very heart of all of this. That means organisations need to think about the capability, you know, and government funding, the streamlining of the, the permitting, all that's to boot with it all. So... Uh, fascinating conversation, but I do believe, and I've seen it change in other industries. And just, just an interesting last point on this, as we, we, we colleagues on this had, had mentioned about, I mentioned Canada. And I know we've got some uh, some uh, industry colleagues from Canada that they have embraced alliancing as part and parcel of that op- of that opportunity because you could not get people to bid on infrastructure, big infrastructure projects, because of that risk profile that we've all discussed uh, and described today. So, but they found a solution, and our solutions out there. And as I said, we are looking forward to the, the Biden, bill, uh, Biden infrastructure bill. We all are. And uh, I think the next challenge is how does our industry respond to that? It's, it's certainly a um, key, key topic. So thank, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Catherine. And, and thank you to the, the panel before. Uh, I'll now ha- pass on to my colleague, Chris. I think he's going to close, close off. Chris, are you there? Yes, I am. <laughs> So I I want to reiterate, hi, I'm Chris Valari. I'm the head of communications for Turner and Townsend, but I'm also uh, leading communications for this new endeavor, Infrastructure Evolution. And uh, I I, I do definitely want to thank all of our colleagues and and our guest speakers who shared their time and their experience and their perspectives with us. Uh, But I do want to let you know that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, As Mary mentioned, our hope is to inspire a movement for change and to create a platform for open discussion where we can talk about some of the best parts of the industry and some of the toughest parts of the industry. In the future, we're going to continue to bring uh, leaders from the finance, construction, technology, and political worlds uh, to continue to explore some of the themes that we went through here today. And so while we're going to bring this event to a close, um, we're really just moving the conversation to our digital platforms. And I've been watching the chat window, so I know that there are a lot of strong opinions about everything that we discussed here today. Uh, And so ultimately, we want this to become a place for exchange of new ideas and bold thinking. And we very much want you to be at the center of it, not at the peripheral, but actively at the center of it. And so I personally want to invite you to reach out to me. Uh, And let's talk about publishing some new content, whether it's thought leadership pieces or video and audio interviews, or even just ideas for future events, or even if you just want to say hello to me. Uh, And I want to I want to stay connected with you and keep this conversation going. Now, in the near term, some of the things that we discussed here today, we're going to formalize them and put them into a white paper that dives into some of the detail. So uh, we'll be posting that on the Infrastructure Evolution website, and I'll also be uh, emailing all of you directly uh, to send you a link where you can find that white paper. So uh, until then, thank you for sharing today with us uh, and with each other. And until the next time, be safe.